Okay, so we're at the halfway point. We've managed to last whole five days without exploding with excitement um, and knowledge integration. <laughs> it's been an amazing week so far. Um, so welcome to session 10 of the Northern Digital Storytelling Festival 2023. Um, where, as I say, we're at the halfway point now. And I must remember to tell people that the clocks go forward on Saturday so we don't have our overseas speakers talking at the wrong time. So don't mm. let me forget Maggie. <laughs> My name is Heather Niven and Maggie, who I've just been talking to, is laughing, um, is my co-host for the night. So if my internet goes down, Maggie's in charge. Um, and we've been working together since before Christmas to pull together this program um, of exciting talks um, with our, some amazing speakers. So for the next hour and a half, we've curated talks and discussions to empower and upskill, inspire and demystify many of the elements of digital storytelling across a spectrum from theatre and screen and mobile to AI and mixed reality technologies, all of which are evolving at a great rate. So through a combination of arts, practice, tech and media, we aim to bring these strands together um, and the industry online to provide a creative space for you lot to chat um, and to be able to sort of find points of synapse that you maybe wouldn't normally get um, by bringing these sort of disparate groups of people together um, for a wee chat over a, a Zoom session. So, so that's kind of the way we've been running the sessions. Um, the festival is designed to be accessible to all. It's free, it's online. Um, we're recording all the sessions and we're putting them on northerndigifest.co.uk um, as, as on the sessions recordings tab. Um, at the end, pretty much about an hour after the end of each session, they're up there ready for you to share widely, watch again or tell your friends or whatever you want to do with them, really. Um, so the format is quite straightforward. Um, a bit of an intro from me um, of all the speakers one at a time. And then we do a 15 ish minute talk, um, have a bit of a Q&A stroke panel discussion at the end. Um, and then we can all go home and oh, we're already home. We can just go to the kitchen and get a glass of wine. It's going to be great. <laughs> you don't even have to get a train. It's fantastic. So, yeah, so that's what we're going to do. It's a pretty relaxed vibe, as I say. Um, you know, just imagine you're sitting having a cup of tea and a bum with your mates. Um, we, we were trying to keep the vibe pretty relaxed and supportive. So let's get started. So I'm going to introduce Nina first, if that's OK. So Nina is the founder director of Love Wish Games. Um, and she's also a games industry veteran with interdisciplinary experience in both programming and design. Primarily focused on narrative for the past eight years, Nina was a finalist in the 2020, 2020 for the Game Dev Hero Award in Writing and Narrative Design for her contributions to Beyond a Steel Sky. She was also a finalist for the Game Designer of the Year Game Hers Award in 2021. Currently, Nina is a games director for Paleo Pines, a highly anticipated title in the wholesome game, game genre, and founder of Love Wish Limited, a game studio which celebrates women and girls' narratives. So, narrative's going to be talking, uh, sorry, not narrative, Nina. <laughs> You can tell it's been a long week, can't you? <laughs> Nina is going to be talking about narrative choice design, where she will discuss how a personal mistake taught her her valuable lesson in storytelling. She's also going to share insights for creating engaging and meaningful interactive storytelling experiences. Over to you, Nina. Hey, thank you so much. Right, let me just share my screen. Uh, there we go. There we go. That one. Share. Okay. Does that work? Are you seeing it full screen now? Yes. Okay, brilliant. So, um, hello. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Heather. I can kind of half skip my own introduction then. Uh, so I'm Nina Ruskov, a narrative designer, technical designer, and game director. I've been in games for a while, as uh, Heather mentioned. Uh, here are some of the games that I've worked on, Broken Sword, Beyond the Steel Sky, and Paleo Pines, which is out this year. It's really adorable game so if you like farming and you like dinosaurs go check it out it's on steam um i also founded love wish in 2021 which is a majority female largely queer and neurodiverse studio uh and as heather mentioned we make games that celebrate girls and women's narratives although you know one could argue what that looks like but for, for us that looks like the stuff that we as a studio enjoy reading and making and these games are there to uh, engage with intelligent gameplay as well so it's not just about the narrative um, starstruck is our first game that we're working on which is a card battler meets romance sim 
anyway, enough about me. Uh, I want to kick it off with what is narrative design in the context of games. And uh, I want to contrast game writing with narrative design, although as a caveat, there isn't like a central definition. And if you look at sort of what narrative designers do in studios, quite often they're games writers uh, and a lot of game writers will do narrative design. So there's a really huge overlap. But for the purpose of what we're talking about today, um, game writing is a focus on the story itself, the dialogue, the characters. It's about the plot. It's about the text content of a game. And then narrative design focuses on the player experience of that story and how the story intersects with gameplay, the place where narrative and gameplay meet. An example of this is ludonarrative dissonance, which is where the story might say one thing and the gameplay might either contradict it or say something different. For example, the story says you are a pacifist who hates violence and the gameplay says you are violently killing people. That's going to make you feel things as a player. You're going to probably have questions about that. You might find it funny. Um, and a narrative designer is going to be able to identify ludonarrative dissonance and make a call about whether that's exactly what you want to do in a game or whether actually you want ludonarrative consistency. Um, choice design is another aspect of narrative design that has the potential to make players feel things. Um, it's a, 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 a something that happens in games where if you want the player to engage with the narrative and have some sort of impact on the narrative, you can offer them narrative choices. And when I first started designing choices, um, the mistake I made is I used to focus on outcomes. And I think that's a very easy mistake to make um, because the player, when they think about a choice, they are usually focused on the outcomes as well. So what that might have looked like is, let's say, from um, a story perspective, we've decided we're going to have two different threads. One is when you pass the witch exam and one is when you fail the witch exam. And so then the choice that you design around that is what spell should the player cast to clear the autumn leaves during the exam either the wind spell, which clears the leaves, or the water spell, which leaves a muddy mess. And, you know, that has those straightforward consequences. But I noticed something over time, something interesting, uh, the more choices that I designed. And I'd like you to focus on the next one and focus on the way it makes you feel. So what will you eat as a snack? Is it the orange or is it the apple? I'm going to ask you the same question again. This time, you are Snow White, what will you eat as a snack, an orange or an apple? Notice how that's different to the first time that question was asked. And yet the question and the options are identical. Why is that? Because the context and the outcome have influenced the way you feel about the choice and the way you feel in that moment of choice. In this choice, your life is at stake. You could be poisoned. But the first time you make that decision, you, you had no idea the apple was poisoned. There was nothing about this choice that would made you make you th think that way. You just think, well, what do I prefer? Do I like oranges better than apples? Or maybe you like the color better or the picture of the girl better. So you're going to feel ne by necessity, you're going to feel about that choice completely differently. So by starting to focus on the choice itself and how that made the player feel, I opened up a whole new world of looking at choice design. In terms of the context that goes into a choice, it's the relevant and irrelevant information that the player has prior to and during the moment of choice. And it frames the type of choice that the player believes they're making regardless of the outcomes. I'll get onto that in, in a moment. But the important thing is the information changes how you look at the choice. Some of the context that the player considers is why do they care? What is their goal? If their goal is to score as many green points as possible, they will choose the green apple probably because that's green. Uh, they'll also take into account the precedence of what's happened before, and that's going to influence how they feel about their uh, choices. And also whether it's possible to fail. Can they get it wrong? And what happens if they get it wrong? You wouldn't have felt the same way about the apple the first time around because you probably didn't think that there was a wrong answer. Uh, but if you are looking out for something poisonous, you're going to be a little more nervous about it. So in terms of precedence, I'm just going to give an example from The Walking Dead, which has been out for quite a while now. And it is a spoiler, but hopefully nothing too heinous for anyone that might be watching this. Uh, basically, in The Walking Dead, um, you are in a world that's full of zombies. It's a really dark world. It's a dark setting and people die all the time. 
Um, periodically in the game, you are presented with a choice where there are two characters, each being attacked by zombies, and you need to choose which one to save. At first, when you encounter this choice, it's difficult, it's harrowing, you feel guilty, you feel a lot of strong emotions about the choice that you're making. But over time, the game sets a precedence because you start to notice that no matter who you save, that character will die later in the episode or maybe the next episode. You're only with that character maybe for another half an hour more before they die. So actually, you're not really choosing who lives. You're just choosing who lives for another half an hour. Uh, and that makes you feel very differently in the later choices because of the precedent, precedent that was said earlier. Um, Here's a, another example, which is uh, from Emma Lady's Made, one of the games that I made, uh, where the player is told very early on uh, that there are two different UI styles for different types of decisions. Some are simple, some are serious, and they have big consequences. For example, when you choose whether you specialize in literature, geography, or history, uh, you know that that's going to have an impact for all of the rest of the game. So the player is going to consider that much more carefully. The other factor is how much information does the player have? Uh, so for example, if I ask you to choose now whether you go left or right, you probably have some preference. But if I give you a little more information, you might have a slightly stronger idea of where you want to go. And if I give you even more information, you're probably going to think that the way out looks a fair lot more appealing than certain death. <laughs> um, so in other words, the way the amount of information that's presented to a player is going to make them feel differently at the moment of choice. If you have no information at all, it creates an element of surprise. It can introduce replayability. It can make you feel uncertain during the moment of choice, but it has the risk of making the player feel frustrated. If you chose the apple and you died, you might go, well, I had no idea that the apple was poisoned. There was nothing, that, no indication of this. This is just random. I have no idea what I'm doing. On the other hand, you could have full information, which allows you to make strategic decisions. You have a lot of clarity. You have a lot of certainty. But if you are going through a maze of caverns and every single option has a sign saying way out certain death, you're just clicking on way out all the time, that's going to be boring. Um, sometimes too much information means that the choice itself isn't interesting enough. And then you have somewhere in between, which encourages thinking, analysis, a uh, sense of risk taking, and giving it a best guess. Um, so here are a few examples. This is from Café Enchanté, which is a romance sim. And you're presented with this, with this choice, and you have no idea what's going to happen in any of these um, scenarios, whatever you choose. The only thing you know is there'll be a character there, but you don't know which one. And that's okay because whoever is there, if you end up romancing them and you play through the game again, you will pick a different choice and then romance that character and play the game again and romance the third character. And that's fine. It just is a way to give you replayability. And it's a surprise the first time around, but it's not a surprise the third time around that you play this game. Here's an example of mixed um, information. So this is from Beyond the Steel Sky, which I worked on, and Alonzo is interrogating you. And the woman in the background is miming the answers. <laughs> and the interrogator can't see her. So you have to guess what she's trying to indicate to you to give the right answer. Uh, and there's quite a lot at stake. So you're going to feel pretty tense about giving the answer, but you're going to have a pretty good idea. And then last but not least, you know with absolute certainty what happens when you relax on the walls because the UI tells you that it's plus one friendship with a particular character. This allows the player to continually pick strategic decisions over time to build up specific stats and also build up relationships with specific characters in order to unlock the narrative content that's there. Um, now, the interesting thing about outcomes is that in the moment of choice, the only outcomes that matter are the ones that the player imagines might happen. Because if the player can't imagine the outcome, it doesn't exist during the choice. Um, when you chose the apple, you probably didn't think it could be poisonous unless you are someone who regularly encounters poison apples, which I hope, really hope isn't the case. <laughs> um, 
so uh, the interesting thing about the fact that it, what matters is the player's perception of the choice is that you can actually divorce the outcome entirely. Um, and by that, I mean, uh, here's an example from The Walking Dead where you, it's one of the first choices, so hopefully not too much of a spoiler. You can choose to either save Duck on the left or Sean on the right. And uh, at the moment of choice, you're probably thinking, okay, well, the, the little boy is more helpless. So I might need to help him um, because the teenager might be able to help himself. Or you might be thinking about the relationship that you have with one of the two boys' parents and how disappointed they would be if you didn't help. Or you might be thinking about the survival of the group and be like, let's ditch the kid. We're going with the teenager. You're having all these thoughts and feelings at that moment because you're imagining that there are two outcomes. You can save one or the other. In reality, no matter who you choose, Sean always dies. The player doesn't know that though. So in the moment of choice, the actual outcome does not matter. Now, here's an interesting thing. If you do save Sean and Sean dies, as a player, you feel like your expectations have been betrayed. But in a game like The Walking Dead that is grim and dark, what that makes you feel is helpless. And actually, that might be exactly what you want the player to feel. If you do it all the time, though, you start to set a precedence, which means that in future choice choices, uh, the player is going to perceive those choices differently. and You're not going to have the same effect again. Uh, and that's always worth considering. Now, even if you do betray the player, player's expectations, there are outcomes that can be modified uh, that honor the player's expectations at the same time. And indeed, The Walking Dead does do that. If you choose to save one kid or the other, your relationships will change with the parents and the, the other characters in, in the camp. If you choose to save Duck, Duck's parents will be really happy with you. And if you choose to save Sean, they'll be really unhappy with you even though the same outcome happens in the end. Those relationships are changed. You can also change the protagonist's stats or reputation or the way that they self-express. Uh, you can change the world. There could be a catastrophe that happens or a city is built or any rumors uh, are spread. The inventory can change. Uh, an item can be added or removed from the player's inventory based on what their choice is. A scene can play out differently. In the example of the, the witch, going to the uh, academy and failing or, or not failing the exam. Let's say you don't want there to be an option to fail the exam. Let's say you want to always be able to succeed. You can still have that choice of a spell and the wind spell makes her like look amazing and the water spell drenches her in water and both clear the leaves. But when she's drenched in water, her peers laugh at her, right? The scene played out differently and the outcome is the same. The story continues. She still enters the academy but you're honoring the player's um, choice. And then last but not least, like branching narrative, you know, endings, it's very commonly used in visual novels. So to recap, uh, when I started designing choices, I used to think about the outcome first and then make a choice fit it. Uh, but these days I focus on the choice itself and how it makes the player feel, what outcomes they imagine, and the context that the player has in order to make that choice. Hope you found that useful. I'm Nina Ruskov. You can find me on Mastodon and I'll be at WAS next Friday if anybody wants to chat with me. Uh, if you're interested in what Lovewish do, you can follow us on Mastodon, LinkedIn and Twitter and there's a list of games that are mentioned. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nina. That was brilliant. Thank you. Much appreciated. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to move swiftly on and I'll introduce the next um, the next speakers for this evening, which is Myra and Simon. Um, so I'll, I'll just um, crack on. So Myra Appena and Simon Wilkinson set up Bright Black in 2019 to explore the radical potential of immersive technologies to create playable interactive experiences that democratise, disrupt and decolonise our culture. Their works have toured 36 countries and five continents, featuring at events including Tate Modern and an abandoned toilet in the Arizona desert. They have hundreds of labs, consultancies and commissions with universities and institutions such as the Royal Shakespeare Company, the British Council and Sydney Opera House. They also mentor emerging and underrepresented artists with the aim of creating a new paradigm for culture that gives power back to the individual and the community. So their talks ask the question, why are video games the dominant cultural medium? 
and who that annoys and why. Over to you guys. Right, let me just... Uh... <laughs> Wow, Nina, that was amazing. It was cool, yeah. eh? <laughs> Brilliant insights, thank you. Yeah, I've taken mental notes. Now I've been learning loads this week. It's really yeah. Awesome. Great, so we will just, yeah, off that intro, um, play our showreel, I guess, uh, as a little uh, taster of stuff we do. So um, yeah, just to say on that inter on the point of interactivity, um, that uh, we've basically been looking at trends in culture and um, noticing that the essentially interactive mediums are in growth and non-interactive mediums are in decline, which is always a great um, bomb to drop in terms of games and how culturally absolutely huge they are and how vast the communities some of the biggest communities on the planet um that exists around it um as well as being players uh creators uh, as well being hugely diverse and a massive part of uh, the creator economy so i will give it over to simon so if you saw our talk the other day you would have heard us say that Video games have gone from 35 billion a year worldwide in about 2011 to something like 200 billion now, where cinema in the same amount of time went from 35 billion, about the same figure in 2011. And it was still about 35 billion in 2018, 2019. And then obviously with the pandemic collapsed to 12.5 and is sort of slowly recovering. But in that time, really, in, in terms of bums on seats, cinema has been in a slow decline and other things have been in rapid decline things like uh, theater has been in rapid decline with a very narrowing demographic um, but within theater immersive i.e theater which puts the audience member at the center of the action has been in growth and so we can see and there's a lot more data we could give you than that but it, it poses the question this sort of question about interactivity and we want to say from the outset that interactivity and adaptability are not the same thing and we're going to just talk through some different types of interactivity and how they relate to adaptability so if any of you played the game oh man i've just forgotten the name of the game on the right florence, florence which is a really cool game for smartphones narrative game um and on the left you've got what remains of edith finch and both of these sort of are games where you will largely uh, experience a story that's been written by a writer and you have limited ability to change and adapt that story to you and your journey so in Florence you can brush her teeth and when you brush her teeth that moves the story forward so you're nudging the story forward with interactions um, in what remains of Edith Finch you are a young woman who is when you look down you see that you're pregnant and everybody in your family dies young and you've just inherited this massive really Id idiosyncratic beautiful house and you wander around room by room finding the story of the people in the house and how they died and it is pretty linear but you get to take your time and do it in your own way um, but at the end of the day if Myra and I played it we would probably play different durations but we would end up having the same story. Then you get into this sort of older school kind of, you know, branching narratives. And this is still from uh, Bandersnatch, which is sort of the heyday, like when I was young and we had these little home computers, which you had to type your own programs into or get a cassette and load it in from. And a lot of those early ones were text-based games. 
And essentially there are branching narratives. And again, when you're playing a branching narrative, and this is what makes it a nightmare for the game maker, is that everything is scripted. So you can move from one, you can move along sort of a, a decision tree, um, uh, but everything is written. And the, actually Brandersnatch is all about that. It's about somebody who goes insane because they're writing a, a branching narrative. Um, so it doesn't really adapt to you, to you per se. It does. Your journey, my, my journey might be different to Mara's, but everything is written. And so there's a concept in game design called emergent behavior. That is behavior that the game developer hasn't banked on. Um, and there is no room for emergent behavior, really. There is just movement through a, a branching narrative. You can also enrich a branching narrative with data collection. So that's what happens when you go on Amazon. Um, you are, every decision you make is logged and, a, and the data is kept. And it could be that when we have our branching narrative, it might be I'm, I'm paying attention to whether you've chosen to go uh, through the door that looks like an exit or the one that looks like a scary room. And so that later on, when you come to make further decisions, I will have that information about your previous choices. And then we have something that emerged, um, like the first game that I played like this was when uh, Grand Theft Auto became open world in format. Uh, I, I mean, when it was really like first, first or third person, like, I can't even remember now. I felt like it was first person, but driving around in a big open world with loads of scope for emergent behavior. And when that happened in my sort of history of playing games, actually Grand Theft Auto, I never played the game once. I just drove cars around off cliffs and stuff like that. And, and me and my friends just did our own thing. And that's purely emergent behavior. And what we were doing with Bright Black was thinking, well, we can, Grand Theft Auto is wicked, Red, De Red, Dead, Red Dead Redemption. I, always, I don't know why I even use that as an example, so I don't even say it. Um, but games like that are brilliant in the, in the way they give you real scope for making your own decisions. But we were wondering what else, as artists, what else can we do with an open world? Um, and we did some experiments and we, made some shows and it just so happened that we were working with an academic who told us that what we were doing was speculative design and we had never come across this term before. But essentially what we were doing was rather than telling a story, we were creating a story world which had a question buried in it. And the role of the audience was to tackle that question. And that poses a different relationship. So rather than thinking of our audience as people who buy tickets and come along, we're thinking of them as, as a hive mind that can tackle a, an important question that has ramifications in the real world. And if you ever read a book on speculative design, you're undoubtedly going to see this diagram. So imagine we're in 2019 and imagine instead of this deck, because we made this slide in 2019, uh, imagine this date was actually 2020. And imagine we throw something into the world, which is there's a pandemic. In 2019, none of us knew what the ramifications of pandemic were going to be. There was lots of rumors, some things happened, some things didn't happen. Some things we knew from the outset definitely were gonna happen. Some things were probable, but actually didn't manifest. Some things were possible and other things outside of this were never gonna happen. And this area here, in effect, is your play space for your audience to explore with their emergent behavior, a narrative where the the, the outcome is purely adaptive. It's all about what they do. So we took um, that framework essentially and um, Hospice UK were doing a commission about how uh, we engage with death in this culture. Um, you're yeah. running, can't wait, can you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the um, question um, that really emerged out of a year's worth of research um, and partnering with them was how do we get people to talk about death? And some of our research um, we uncovered was about how people who regularly consider their mortality experience much better well-being and are much less likely to stick to um, one story of themselves. So whether that's nationalism, it could be fascism, it could be not being able to see the world from any multiple perspectives, but one perspective. Um, and it's all rooted in fear. So the fear of death was kind of the main body of that work. Um, and so this idea about how we engage in conversation and use the virtual space actually to go beyond the human. 
So we um, have done the first stage of this experience, which as a screen-based experience, you walk into a venue. This is the Spire in Brighton, which is a beautiful old church we filled with um, fake candles. You walk up the aisle, and you walk onto the altar and there's a gaming chair and a big screen and you open up that screen and it's a beautiful um, uh, river flowing with natural, the natural world all around you, birds flocking, um, the sun going down and you meet these two virtual characters. Um, and these characters um, welcome you and they start to open up this conversation about this last day. Um, and we've also adapted that into a VR experience. So taking it, really into um, investigating how far we can take people on that journey and into a very first person immersive experience. We then take the conversations that we have and isolate that audio and create a live AV set, basically made of the conversations that we've had. Um, if the visuals are inspired by that, the audio weaves in and out of an electronic music soundtrack, what, everyone has said. So we've posed a question, we've used the technology to go beyond the human and actually people were able, because they're not faced with sitting in front of a person asking them about death and their mortality, to really um, sort of transcend any kind of judgment, fear of judgment or um, fear or inhibitions um, and go into these very expansive spaces. And then we get we gather everyone um, for the live AV experience to listen to what everyone else has to say about their, about how they think about death. Um, and this leads us to a much more complex, um, rich understanding of what it is. So this presentation is a bit like a greatest hits. We've got, we've got so many presentations on this subject that we've sort of, we're just going to- Remixed it. <laughs> yeah, we're going we're to dive a little bit. So Mara mentioned that that installation, it started off as a screen-based game, which you sit in a beautiful gaming chair in a beautiful church and you play it and these characters are speaking to you in real time. Uh, and then what we did was create a VR version of that. And what we know from research coming out of Sussex University is that perspective really matters in terms of spatial awareness uh, and how it affects a story. So take something like, um, this is Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. If you've, ever, if you've never played that, it's a beautiful uh, game that was made by a, a studio called Chinese Room in Brighton. Um, won loads of awards, the soundtrack won loads of awards. And it's, a, it's an open world story and you're in first, perspe first person perspective the whole way through. And then you have something like Red Dead Redemption. I said it correctly this time. And you can actually move perspectives, but we're gonna show you here the third person perspective. So you're looking from behind, you can see yourself. Uh, and then you have games like Brothers of Tales, which is Two Sons, which is another really beautiful game. And this is in top-down perspective. And what Sussex University found um, when they tested people who played games in these three different perspectives is if they played a game for say an hour, in a landscape or a building or whatever. And at the end of that hour, they were asked to draw, draw on a piece of paper from a top-down perspective, uh, what the location was and what it looked like and where all the rooms were, where all the features were. People in first person perspective had the least um, accurate mapping of that space. And people in top-down had the most accurate. Uh, and that's not surprising really, but I guess when you're making VR, it throws a problem. And when you're in uh, first person, it throws a problem. And there are many solutions to that. Um, so if you take a game like Firewatch, which again is another gorgeous game, uh, you're in first person perspective, it takes place in a national park. And when you start playing, you're wandering around with this perspective and you can't find your way anywhere. You've got to find your way to things and it's confusing. And it's confusing for quite a while. And, and you have to find your way to the solution and the solution is a tower where you are, it's essentially your base where you, all your stuff is stashed. And when you climb to the top of there, of course, suddenly you're looking down like a, like a top-down perspective on the world. And from that point on, the, the, it's almost like the first part of the game, they've, they've gone, okay, where you're playing this game is a big place because you feel lost the whole time. 
but they don't want you to stay lost for the whole game because then you'd be focusing on completely the wrong things. So when you go up into the tower and you look across, suddenly you go, oh, that's where that was. That's where that was like that. And from that point on, you actually navigate uh, using a mental map that you've, you have, actually, you actually do have a map as well, but you're navigating without that map largely because you, you have it all up in your head. Now this has bearing. So we did a, a consultation for the ambulance service in Western Australia, helping them build VR training tools for medics um, uh, to learn to do their job. And of course, when you're playing a game, what you want is that the early, early uh, levels are fairly simple and each successive level is more of a challenge. And it just so happens that when you're learning uh, to deal with an accident in the street, for example, let's say it's a car crash, um, that in real life, you would step out of an ambulance and there's chaos, right? And that's really a big challenge if you're in first person perspective, which you are when you're a human being. Um, so what we did was in the early stages of the game they play to train themselves, they actually parachute in, not actually with a parachute, but they arrive from above so that they can map the scene, see where the dangers are, see how they're gonna, they've got a little bit of time to see how they're gonna tackle the problem. In the later stages, that um, parachuting in stops and suddenly they're in the same perspective they'll be when they're, when they're going live into the real world. And this is from Mara. Yes, so um, taking all those ideas into the idea of a, um, a world essentially that you, enter um, and as creators we're looking at it um, as a game system space in game system design it's called a possibility space so you are essentially architecting what happens in that space but you aren't necessarily dictating it so under the hood with game system design as opposed to games design um, you're looking at uh, as the practical application of positive psychology. And there's a games academic called Jane McGonagall who looked at how you can use game system design to design the real world better. And um, you can tell from the title of her book is Reality is Broken, um, that these sort of systems and these ideas are really lacking in the real world. Um, and the kind of detachment and apathy is because largely we're living in a non-participatory culture. We don't understand, you know, we've lost the kind of connection with our, um, with our ability to make decisions that actually affect the world. Um, and this is possibly, you know, a reason why there's this huge exodus into virtual spaces where you can be a creator, create your own world, create your own reality and live a, a more free life um, and that's maybe where when we get to 5G, 6G, 7G, and we have twin worlds that we dip in and out of, we have more agency, we have more capacity to um, make connections um, and build our own communities. Um, so, yeah, and these, these the tenets of um, this game system design principle are built on human chemicals, so the hormones and the uh chemicals surging through our blood and so dopamine is a key one um which you will know as like the reward chemical if you come across it before um the reason you pick up your phone and the apps are all really bright and look like sweeties it's firing off all your dopamine and then you can't stop picking up your phone and looking at it um and there's apps now that you know black and white out your phone so you lose the sort of juicy taste in your mouth um, even that anticipation of, um, ex, you know, an exciting event can give you a dopamine hit. So not even the thing itself. Um, Fiero, which is a games concept, again, but relates into to the real world massively, is um, when you've gained the knowledge, acquired the skills, improved your abilities, overcome a difficult challenge. This is how these spaces are designed. Like Simon said, you're you gently ramp up overcoming challenges, becoming more advanced, becoming more skilled. And eventually you crack something. Maybe you've been having a go at it for like um, 20 minutes and you the rush that goes through your body is a physical reaction and you punch the air. Um, and when we tour around the world and we talk about some of these ideas um, and how people relate to them in the real world, it's normally when people are in a creative endeavor 
like they've just cracked how to do something or a sort of physical thing where they're you know like learning to skateboard and they just you know manage to do a trick um and these these kind of states are these huge states of well-being that we'll talk about in a minute oxytocin you know there's this obviously this myth of the gamer or people that engage in virtual spaces as solitary alone sitting in the dark eating crisps by themselves but actually they're just these huge communities and um that's because oxytocin is designed into the system so community connection um and this next concept of um Natchez, um which is people mentoring each other through game spaces so um this sort of pride in people's achievements. And if you have a newbie joining a game that you can really um, accelerate their, their journey by sharing knowledge and skills and how to do stuff. And the content online is massive. Obviously there's loads of YouTube videos of um, video game playthroughs on Twitch. It's the second biggest category that's watched. Um, so that everything around it is so rich as well. Um, and endorphins, so the positive stress chemical, you might normally relate this to like um, doing a run or something, but in game spaces, um, the idea that you're constantly being challenged and just beyond your abilities and you're then able to overcome that challenge and then you go to the next one. These are huge motivators and they trigger your endorphins and they make you feel alive. So if you take... Uh... I guess the, the constituent parts of what makes a game with all of the other stuff that Marish has described, what we aim for is getting our players, our audiences into a flow state. And a flow state is a, is a term that came around in the 70s from a psychologist in America. Um, and he, he proposed and put forward proof that a flow state is a thing that is really healthy for a human, human being. A flow state is that a moment where you are fully immersed where you are in, engaged in endeavor i get it when i play table tennis so if i'm playing table tennis i forget about time i forget who i am i'm just it's just me and the ball and my opponent and for that moment also a lot of people experience it when they're driving um where you kind of lose you realize you've just ridden two miles and you didn't appear to be paying attention you did pay attention but it was a different you were in a different state and um so the constituents of a game that make flow states uh, is the same thing as what makes a flow state happen. So do you have a, and, and this is a good example of a flow state. These two women here hurtling down a hill at high speeds. They have a, a clear goal that they're aiming for, which is something you have in a game. There are challenges and obstacles to overcome. And these are, or limitations, let's say. So they want to get down to the bottom of the hill in one piece, they, which involves not crashing into cars, not going off the road and various other things. This really focuses the mind, but also in a game, it's feedback from the system. How am I doing? Those three, three things create the, the environment where if you do a good job, you can put someone in a flow state like so. And we're going to jump to another concept here, which is where when we're working. So we, we start making VR a long time ago. Comparatively, we started making VR in 2010. At that point, between 2010 and 2014 slash 15, VR was really female dominated because it was coming out of theater more than it was coming out of tech. Uh, when 2014 brought Oculus DK1, and then very much when it brought DK2 in 2015, the conferences on VR suddenly became very male dominated until women were sort of engineered back in. And, and it's sort of the sickness of the corporate disease that, um, that sort of played out. But in those early years, there was a lot of experimentation. It was a, a real moment for pioneers. And one of the things that we were thinking about as people who were making VR at that point was multi-sensory immersion. Because we weren't going to release things on the Oculus Store, because there was no Oculus Store, because we weren't going to release them on Steam or on a PlayStation, we had latitude to do things that you could never do on those platforms. So one thing that was immediately obviously interesting was a thing called the rubber hand dilution, which was a piece of uh, psychology uh, an experiment that was from the 1990s. And what it essentially demonstrated was that reality, and bear in mind we're dealing with virtual reality, reality for a human being is when two senses agree even if those senses are wrong. So the rubber hand illusion 
what happens is that um, somebody puts their hand on a desk, their hand is hidden from them and a rubber hand is put in view. So at this point, they have a, the, in this case, the guy's left hand, he can see and he can feel. The rubber hand, he can see but can't feel. The right hand, he can feel but not see. But when the paintbrush is duplicated in terms of its actions on both the rubber and the real hand, the brain adopts the rubber hand um, as its own. And at that point, if the experimenter pulls out a hammer and bangs it on that rubber hand or an axe, um, their body will give off all the chemicals as if they've really been axed in the hand. Now, if you're making virtual reality between 20, 2010 and 2014, this is super interesting. And so we made a series of works which did the rubber hand illusion, but with a VR headset, where essentially we were reiterating to the user, the audience member, that the body they see in VR is their real body by having touch, taste, smell, and so on. And so we were thinking about telling stories not only to the eyes and the ears or immersing the eyes and the ears, but immersing all of the senses as much as we could. And that was the use of subwoofers in seats that would vibrate if you're in a car, when a car went faster, it would vibrate more, more aggressively and less when it was still. Um, if you opened a window in VR, there would be a fan that would switch on with an Arduino so that you get the wind in your face, all of these kind of things to immerse people much more deeply. So how are all these um, worlds and spaces being made? So whether it's VR apps, um, screen games, we use games engines. So we are, our key artistic tool is to use real-time engines. So Two big ones are Unity and Unreal, and they are moving so fast in terms of what, how you use it and what you can build. It's becoming really intuitive. So you are going in, you might not know how to 3D model. You might be just going on the asset store and buying 3D models and you can prototype or build a city, a infinite moonscape, a, you know, thing, um, underwater experience um, using assets. You can add beautiful spatial sound to that um, wind and um, all these elements that make it feel alive. So the headset, the phone, um, your screen are becoming our venues and they are metaverses um, beyond what um, Mark Zuckerberg's weird uh, conference call room vision of that is. Um, and they are, they already exist. They're already um, massive games like Fortnite, who, for example, they've just released a games engine within Fortnite, um, acknowledging that people don't necessarily, or less and less, over 50% of their players go in to play the game they go into wanting to build their own world. So this emergent behavior, this creative energy that is um, not just consuming stories, but making your own. Minecraft is one of the biggest games and that is millions of stories happening every day, all these worlds being built. These are play spaces, you know, we, are, we lose that as we become institutionalized in schools, college, work, all of that but when we're young we sit and we imagine worlds and we make little worlds um that's what's really exciting about this technology and the film industry is really um taking um this idea and using games engine in virtual production which is essentially shooting again creating a scene in a, uh, a video a video game engine and um projecting it on or sort of showing it on a massive LED screen, which gives off the scene light as well as providing the environmental visuals. Um, and rather than flying massive crews and cast out to the desert, like in The Mandalorian, you can be in a production studio and switch scenes um, and have eternal golden light. And so it's very appealing um, for the movie industry. Um, and if you think about the fact that the games engines are inherently interactive, then currently that is not being embraced by the film industry because they are interested in broadcast linear stories. But the potential for if you are now making films in games engines or with them um, is that we have these quite complicated, intuitive worlds that we engage in from that point of view as well. Okay, we've run out of time, so should we um, 
cut that there. Yeah, we were just going to show you a bit of our music video that we recently shot um, on a virtual production wall, um, but we have run out of time. You can watch it on, on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. I've experienced it firsthand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, guys. That was brilliant. Um, and you did run over time, but I didn't want to stop you because I was just so into what you were saying. So um, so thank you for that. It was really excellent. And loads, more, loads, loads more food for thought. Um, I, every time I hear you two, uh, I always like want to run off and like get open unity and make something, you know, so <laughs> you're really inspirational. So thank you for that. Right, Ben, you're up next. Are you ready? <laughs> okay, let me introduce Ben. So Ben's a senior lecturer in interactive media in the School of Arts and Creative Technology at the University of York. Ben is a creative, te I've just done that, uh, a creative technologist with over 20 years experience building playful, gameful and strange interactive experiences. Hmm, that sounds intriguing. Um, since 2019, he has collaborated with nine theatres across Europe in the Creative Europe funded Play On project developing productions that use elements from game design and immersive technology to experiment with new forms of, of storytelling. In this session, Ben will highlight game design and theatre using play on productions, for examples, and he'll also reflect on what he's learned about storytelling, both from theatre and from games. Over to you, Ben. Yeah, thanks. I always regret putting that 20 year thing in. It makes me just feel suddenly really old. <laughs> You're in good company. <laughs> My first programming job was fixing Y2K bugs, so that both ages me, but also you know you're all welcome. Uh, for, <laughs> that's it. Uh, I'll just share my slides. I'll share sound. Cool. Okay. So uh, yeah. So thank yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, as mentioned, uh, yeah, I'm a senior lecturer in tech media, and yeah, my background is in this creative technology, which is basically, yeah, making weird things with interesting people is a short way to describe it. Um, yeah, and that's that that's involved yeah, like telecom companies like Telecom Italia and Philips and um, yeah, BBC and NHS, but like loads of random things, but especially kind of really small. Uh, sort of prototype things that use some kind of play element or some kind of some kind of game element in them uh yeah so my, that's kind of nature of my research is in uh, is in design research uh, around around games and play uh so yeah and the play on project is is a key thing that I want to talk about which is um yeah this european creative europe project um yeah, nine theaters as mentioned but i think what, what's particularly interesting is it's a cultural project so this isn't a research project, uh, which is quite different for me, which is uh, th th this is about theatres working together with the advice of, of academics and, and technologists. Um, and the, the main outputs of that is a series of productions. So here's nine of the, of the theatres that are involved. They've been working since 2019. Um, and because they wanted to especially to use ideas from game design, it's how I became involved. So I'm, I'm not a theatre person at all really so there's been a lot of learning both ways and so my approach going into this talk is to sort of reflect a little bit on that um that might be valuable for games people thinking about working with theatre or, or or vice versa it's also uh not, not exhaustive so there's loads of cool stuff happening um like, like far beyond play on um so yeah this isn't just like i'm not trying to make like canonical examples of this stuff but also, it you know, it, it's always good when a speaker apologizes at the beginning of the talk, which is but my, my, this is still in the middle of this project, right? So we've been working a few years, but there's, there's still it finishes next year in 2024. Uh, so um, so yeah, these yeah, my reflections are ongoing, and my ideas about what's important, and what isn't important, are kind of changing. Uh, but I thought anyway, it would be good to have that initial reflection, and I'm going to introduce a couple of projects I've been involved with in Play On um so and then we'll try and make some sense of, of them afterwards <laughs> so first of all is um this production called football from this is from teatro bando who are based in palmela which is uh, near lisbon in portugal who are one of the, the play on partners and uh football is um it's a show exploring the history of, of football but especially how it relates to social issues so explores topics like sexism, racism, fascism through the lens of a sport, which is yet yeah, it's deeply political, no matter what the Tory papers think. Uh, and the twist in the show is that each performance is designed as a football match. 
So at different points in the show, the audience is asked to vote to substitute different actors into different roles. Um, and so there are four actors and then there are four roles at any one given point during the show. And there's several scenes where the, the, the characters change. But it's the audience who decides which actor plays which role in, in each scene. And depending on how the scenes play out and different configurations, uh, goals might be scored by one of the teams or one of the or the other team. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of quite complex to sort of explain, but it's uh, yeah. The, the show. What, what's really interesting about it is is this idea that each show becomes a football match uh, uh, through which the, the themes are explored, and then they toured the show around Portugal. Um, uh, and so each performance then becomes like an, a, a match within uh, like a, within a season, within yeah, a theatre season and a football season. Um, and there's a league table become generated because we have matches with scores. We have winners and we have losers. And then over the course of, uh, of course, of several months, we sort of build this football narrative outside the show as well as inside the show. Uh, so the whole show is mediated through this app. Um which is so it's used in voting during the show, so it helps audience members sort of pick like which which roles we played by which of which of the actors. But it's also a sort of souvenir. So it again it sort of links into uh, like existing football apps that you might use where you you track your team's progress, you get updates, you know, you, you hear about the new goals and who scored them, and and, and you see what happens in the league. Um, yeah. Again, I'm going, to, I'm going to circle back to all three to the things I'm going to introduce because there's, there's some interesting stuff going on. But the next is uh, is the archive from um, from Pilot Theatre. So I know Lucy Hammond from from Pilot already talked a little bit about it. Um, I'm going to show that just a little bit of a, the video intro. Hopefully Hello. Hello. Is this thing on? Hello. I am the archivist, and this is the archive. As you know from the Assessment Centre, the Archive is a worldwide operating agency that for hundreds of years has collected and catalogued documentation from the lives of thousands of individuals. Your job will be to help us digitise. Welcome to the Archive. Cool, so, um, so yeah, as mentioned, so Lucy's introduced it's a bit more, but I'm going to provide a different angle. So I was academic advisor on this project. The game designer was uh, Johannes May, who's uh, this German game designer who's really, really creative and really interesting. Um, and, and there's also the, this, this other team who obviously made the, the visuals and the environment and things like that. Uh, so, but very briefly, it's a non-linear game, uh, like experience. I, I called it a game by mistake there. It's a game like experience. And it's for teenagers and young adults based around this idea of unsent messages. And it's it, it's non-linear in that you sort of you 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 pick up you find out the stories through um, engaging with uh, yeah like little uh, bits of material photographs snippets of audio like notebooks receipts um, yeah napkins and, and there's loads of like little things that that all come together to to form a story um, and it's, this is intended to be used by an individual or a small group uh, so it's a bit different from like an auditorium based sort of experience. Uh, but it's that it's that kind of way that the interaction sort of tells the story, which is kind of really <laughs> listening to the previous two talks is really really cool to see how this all kind of lines up quite nicely. Um, so it has also, I think, what, what I particularly like about it is this uh, the interface and the, the sort of way it looks. So it has this really incredible dreamlike and and detailed visual style. It feels like a bit like Brazil via mid nineties. Uh, computer game uh, sort of thing that's that's really cool but it sort of invites play around the environment it's again i'll come back to this but the way the way that things are, uh, move and the way thing the way things exist in, in the world is kind of really invites some interaction that's a lot of fun uh, and the, the third one project i wanted to introduce was uh, one called arolo which is from calibri theater in budapest in hungary again there's a video but i'll cut this one off a little bit earlier
um, yeah, the, the full trailer and, and some more videos from that are available on YouTube, but um, I'll keep things moving. So uh, so Arlo is it's Hungarian for, for traitor. Um, and, and as soon as I said traitor, then again, we're talking about pilot theatre. So this is uh, this is a show from uh, Esther Richardson and Cecily Lundsholt, um, a Norwegian theatre maker. Um, and there's been a sort of series of different kinds of productions of Traitor. And this is a different one to one Lucy was talking about that Pilot did. This is a, sort of a, a different iteration that I worked on with um, yeah, Calibri Theatre, who are based in uh, Budapest in Hungary. Um, so in, in short, it's this interactive and branching story where the audience follows a, deliver, a pizza delivery person who accidentally courts up in this uh, mysterious uh, story of intrigue between a company who wants to deploy invasive surveillance and, uh, and a rebel group who want to stop them from doing it. And so the audience makes key decisions of the show um, like and the story changes accordingly. So it has a, its base, it's this branching narrative structure that we've talked about a little bit already. Um, uh, the further little twist here is that the that in, in the case of Arlo, it uses the mobile phone as the interface to this. So first of all, as a it, as a way to collect votes. So in the auditorium, there's a stand in front of each of the uh, seats, which is holding a phone that we've provided for them, and it's quite visible. It's kind of kind of quite in your face. These devices, and the, and the, the votes appear simultaneously. So I wrote some software that was able to sort of yeah to do this sort of simultaneous across um, yeah thirty or forty devices. Uh, where yeah uh, we trigger a, a vote is triggered and then uh, the votes appear live on on screen you can see uh, like how decisions are swinging and then the the, the show changes in response to those votes and there's also other kinds of interactions so you saw in the video there's like text messages that you'll receive through the devices you also get phone calls and you navigate maps and you yeah and in this example you um um yeah you're you're switching on and off cctv Okay, so but I think what's particularly interesting about it is that the, the role of the phone changes. So this isn't just using the phone instead of like holding your hand up to make a decision. It's uh, it's about surveillance technology and the the role of mobile devices in that. So a lot of the a lot of the time, actors are interacting with phones on stage and interacting with each other via phones that they're holding, as well as the audience is using. And so over time, the, the role of the phone sort of changes. Um, I hope I'm not spoiling it for too much, but I'm not sure how many people speak Hungarian anyway. So, um, but yeah, over the course of the story, the phone, you know, the phone becomes much more suspicious uh, and it's become, it's not stops being this passive thing that you're interacting with, but also a sort of character in, in the show too. Um, yeah, so I've, I've really kind of run through sort of a couple of a couple of shows. There's a bunch of other other ones that have happened. So as mentioned, there's there's nine theaters. We're in the third year, so there's been we're yeah into like twenty seven different shows at the moment. Um, uh, so yeah, I'd encourage you to have a look at the website. There's loads of cool stuff happening. Um, and uh, but what I wanted to do is sort of my role as a, as a game designer in the project. I've had to sort of my hand in quite a lot of the different productions, sort of some more than others. So in the case of things like Arlo and football, uh, you know, I'm much more involved with the creative team and others much more on a sort of advisory basis where yeah, people, people know I know about games and then we'll, we'll come and ask questions or I'll be able to give them technical advice and things like that. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, this is an ongoing project. Um, and what we're trying to do is sort of like reflect and think about okay as a game designer coming into this what what has been different and and, and what have I, I need to think about uh, a bit more again a, a second apology here that uh, it's kind of half-baked ideas I'm, I'm i'm not that committed just yet so if someone was to say actually ben you think you're a bit wrong about that i'll probably be like yeah <laughs> you probably are um so they, they can still use a bit more refinement but i think just as sort of initial reflections it's going to help me sort of figure out what like what the hell am i doing uh so <laughs> I think the first one, um, and for me, I think probably the most surprising one is, is this question, which is initial like audiences for first sort of experiments with this is you'd have a sort of Q&A with audiences at the end. And nearly every Q&A, the, the very first question is is this, which is like, was it real, <laughs> right? Like, was the show that we just seen, like, was it real or was it just like pre-decided? Pre and it, 
it seems like there's this kind of strange assumption that that the the experience is always the same right so the interactivity is actually just a cool special effect that we that, that's been applied um and so in other words it doesn't matter what the audience does that the show is always the same uh, so this is really this is really interesting sort of like perception angle and it's especially between games so coming to games you have sort of the opposite which is when you're playing a game there's the assumption might be that it's your fantastic skills that have allowed the success in the in the story to happen uh, when actually you know a lot of the game might be just on rails completely and and the path very very strictly defined um so um so yeah, I think so. In, in theatre, in this sort of space, there's this kind of work, having to work extra hard to prove this. To, to like, how do you prove to the audience as, as fast as possible, like like how this is real? Like, yeah, your, your choices matter here, and things will change based on your decision making. Uh, so again, yeah, speaking back to things that, that Nina was talking about earlier too, um, and yeah, one of the interesting approaches here, I think, in the archive is the using uh, game visual language to and interaction types to sort of communicate space of possibility uh, within that game so yeah because you have a mouse cursor and there's things that glow that you can click on and you can move them about is it, it this is a game and i understand how games work this is this is real now um it's not just like a video i'm i'm, I'm experiencing and sort of related to this is this um this this question again uh yeah to, to, to nina uh, yeah, Myra and Simon have, have all talked about this, which is um, just kind of the linearity or the branching aspects. Um, and it's this experience that, um, yeah, the it's the experience of the audience is often linear in, in sort of interactive theatre, as I've experienced it at least. Um, and I think so. Sort of, there's this kind of natural idea that I think uh, like a branching narrative is like a really easy tool to jump for. And a lot of partners I've worked with have kind of it seems very comfortable. It seems very close to to what theatre makers have are comfortable with, and and then you know to jump on it and then stick with it. But obviously, there's the complexities that yeah that the other speakers have talked about. Um, and and then at the end of it all is this this thing where it's only the theatre makers that actually see all the different branches of the the narrative because each audience always just has a linear experience. And if every audience has a linear experience, then like why bother? <laughs> With 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 having the interactivity at all, uh, yeah. Plus the comp yeah the complexity problem with the branching, yeah. The, and yeah, Nina's, Nina's example from The Walking Dead was really great, which is you very quickly learn in The Walking Dead that branches close off really quickly because it's so expensive to have the branches continually going outwards. Um, so yes, so with my notes. Something interesting here is this idea of balance, um, which I think yeah, adds on to what other people are speaking about in terms of branching narratives, which is uh, an example of this is in Arlo. There's a key decision about which character to follow, but uh, the first few audiences would always choose the same um, the same option all the time. And so then there's this kind of game design, that, like immediately, I'm, oh, this is a balance problem, uh, which uh, partners hadn't really had to deal with before, which is what you need to do is, yeah, as Nina is talking about, revisiting the, the moments of choice and then thinking about what the what you're telling the audience up to then. And, and um, you know, if, if certain choices are, are generally more favorable, then probably your audiences will always choose those choices. So balancing the story to make the choices a bit a bit more uh, a bit more challenging and a bit more close to make a bit more tension or the opposite which is making false choices that you don't have to rehearse because you know that your, that your audience will always go one way um and yeah adding a little bit onto this is the in, in the archive uh, which is the pilot production um this approach is really interesting because it's it's there's, there's much less linearity to it. You you experience a lot of the story at, at your own pace, uh, but there's a process of writing that went to that. So so writers were commissioned to write short stories, but then there's a really fascinating process of unpicking those stories and trying to turn them into um, like non-linear pieces that actually still sort of made sense when you when you put them all together. And so that and that that's one of the big challenges is like giving up a bit of that authorial control over the story which which can be quite difficult i think yeah understandably 
uh, yeah, the final thing, and I'll, yeah, maybe time as well, is uh, yeah, the magic circle, which is yeah, a core concept in game studies, which is very briefly this idea of uh, game spaces as being outside real life. So when you enter the within the magic circle, rules work slightly differently. This can be like a literal circle, like a boxing ring. When you enter a boxing ring, you are allowed to punch the person <laughs> that's in there with you, whereas outside you're not allowed to punch them. Um, and there's this idea of the losery attitude, the L-U-S-O-R-Y, which is about like your, the co social contract that you're engaging with as you play the game. And theatre already has this a lot, but the rules are different than in, in games. So there is work to do to, to, to games and interaction are sort of a transgression of the typical rules. So how do you communicate both how the rules are changing in that environment, but also what, what, is, what is now allowed and what is still not allowed? Uh, so okay, this this photo is from from football, and one of the ways to do that is through onboarding. So in football, every audience member is issued a scarf, and uh, also given a newspaper. Uh, so that you enter the auditorium as if you know on on your way to the football match, you know, with your app and your newspaper and your scarf, and suddenly it's like okay, no, so the the rules here are more related to football than they are to, to theatre. So it's kind of like neat little touches, um, like chanting and getting people to sing um finally uh, is that space for spectating which is like how do do how does the audience opt out of of the games and how do they choose uh, not to participate and and just spectate which, which should be fine in the case of football it works really well because the ones holding the scarf up above and, and singing the songs and then there's people who put the scarf immediately down and then uh, and then that can that tells you quite a lot about okay how 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 is that audience member engaging and and how do we also ensure that the spectators are enjoying this as much as the participants cool uh yeah so last slide which is uh i'm trying to make a conclusion so sort of, kind of a coherent one I'm not really sure it's kind of in the middle of this but these are the sort of questions I'm asking myself at the start of new projects with like implementing games and theatre which is yeah first of all like as for the audience how do we prove it's real how can we prove it what are the rules to this environment what are we allowed to do what aren't we allowed to do can we say no and uh yeah, something that Lucy touched on in her talk a few days ago as well is this like the idea of failure so failure is kind of a key concept in games like how do we do how do you deal with that cool so uh yeah these can be answered before during and after the show and in a combination uh yeah I'm going to stop there but uh yeah as you can see sort of half baked but um it's been really interesting working with, with theatres uh it's very new for me and uh and, and yeah it's kind of a, a lot more different than I thought would be given how close an experience they seem initially Thanks. Thank you very much, Ben. That was really insightful. My quest, first question is, uh, did you sell pies? <laughs> the football one? <laughs> that seemed to be the key ingredient that was missing. It was a, a fine pie for the break. <laughs> I've never had, had Bovril before, so trying to explain the, the, the nature of Bovril to oh. his colleagues <laughs> and the importance of it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I remember that when I was at school. And you'd go out to make snowmen and stuff. You'd come in, and your mum would have made you like. Except we had the cheap version. We had an oxo cube in hot water. <laughs> and it was disgusting. I'm now a vegetarian, thank God. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> that was a bit of a blast from the past. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions coming through. Um, let's have a look then and see. Nina, how much information should you give to the audience, and does the amount of agency affect this decision? That's from Robbie. Gosh. Uh, well, I, I mean, um, the information, the amount of information to give really depends on the feeling that you want to create. So again, less information means you're going to, the whoever is making that decision is going to have, have to deal with a lot more uncertainty and think more, guess more. Um, so certain games are more suited to that than others. Certain experiences are more suited to that than others. Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah Masters has come up with a question for anyone. Do you think that multi-sensory experiences or interactive storytelling have the potential to be more persuasive or create deeper impact for speculative or transform transformative design for serious messages rather than linear storytelling? So Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon um, 
for quite a long time has been looking into this stuff and they did some research. They created a scale called the transportation scale, which is um, looking at how deeply someone is immersed. And, and when they were researching this initially, it was actually written texts. And even with written texts, they were able to demonstrate that when uh, a series of things that are fascinating about human beings. One is if you're reading a story and it's uh, in first person perspective, then you're far more likely to take on board the issues and the messages in that newspaper article or that um, story. Um, if you are reading a first person perspective story, however, and you are, it's shown to you that the person you're reading is not like you, then you will reject immersion and you won't be as persuadable. However, if you aren't told who this person is, but you, they're essentially you, and you invest in the story um, something like two thirds of the way through, if it's then revealed to you that this person is very different from you, you're already too invested and you are very persuadable in terms of um, the, the predicament of this character. So obviously this has big uh, ramifications if we are telling a story about a woman and you're a male reader, or if we're talking about a black man and you are a white female. Um, and we want you to get into the story. So it's important. Obviously, when you're doing something in virtual reality, you are inherently in first person perspective. Um, so there's there's a bit of something there. Um, I, I don't know about in terms of interactivity. I, I haven't read any data on that. P human, I think we were saying last time human beings have been incredibly persuadable, even with text. Ever for the you know that if you think of the 20th century as the history of the development of industrialized persuasion from the Creel Committee in the First World War right through to the 1930s with um, uh, the Mohawk Valley formula and the SA engineering consent, what these wealthy, powerful people were showing off about is that they could make ordinary people do terrible, terrible things just by telling them a story. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there was much space to get more persuadable than we already were. But certainly when you're in a virtual reality uh, world, you are, it's not just your eyes and ears, your, your muscles, your body is responding to the challenges that you're facing as well. With um, choices in terms of interactivity, um, uh, the internalization of a state is really powerful. So with complex choices like um, that evoke feelings of guilt, complicity, pride in particular, um, rather than watching a character in a broadcast medium, <clears throat> a story would look at how a character um, starts on an ordinary day and then changes over the course of the story. Um, and you observe that character making those decisions and reflect on that. Um, in a passive way but if you are in the story and you are making the choices so you choose to kill this person you choose to cheat on this person as ha what happened the context of firewatch for example um then you experience the guilt um and or you are complicit in that and that has a really um, powerful emotional impact there's an amazing games designer that design created a game called train which is a totally analog game, not digital. And you essentially you are putting these little yellow figurines into a carriage and they are using the mechanics of um, game system design. So to get you into a flow state so that you are quickly putting these um, characters in the carriage as much as possible so they can get to their destination. The game is about the Holocaust and it basically showed that um, the systems that were used, um, that it wasn't about bad people doing bad things. It was much more complicated that, than that because to engage a mass population in the absolute um, horrendous things that happened, um, you had to use psychological techniques. You had to use massive bureaucratic systems to do the industrialized um, death that happened. And people that who were basically realized they were in this flow state and they were optimizing for getting people on trains, getting to the destination and then realized what was going on. Uh, you know, they had they were extremely tearful. People got very upset. People were like finding it very difficult, but it internalized the state of what is possible. 
rather than being judging others and saying, you know, these are bad people, there's some moral judgment there. It's like it is possible for everyone to be turned into this person. That's a much more complex and powerful message. Deep stuff, eh? Okay. I'm going to move on to the next question, if that's okay. Uh, ben, is there anything you've learned from theatre that you would bring into games design? Not like we're putting you on the spot or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, th I think I, I fell into the trap that I talked about audiences falling into, which is this understanding of, of theatre as being this, like a film, right, which is which just happens and you're, you're, just, you're just there. Uh, but in, in, you know, I talked about how, how do we make theatre interactive? The answer is always, well, it's theatre has always been interactive. Um, it's just the other technologies that are changing. Um, and so, so associated with that was, for me, was uh, I think the attitude of, of theatre makers, and this might just be the theatre makers I'm working with, but certainly, you know, this is fairly broad, but uh, this sort of quickly reflexive and changing attitude and this the, the sort of risk taking as well so which i think we could learn a lot from so for example i'd, I'd get a question for advice about some technology it's like oh we're thinking about using a mobile phone and we we'll use gps to to sort of manage our, our show and i'm like well okay but have you thought about all the things that could go wrong and, and how would you like how are you going to deal with that and then like the, literally would laugh in my face which is like this yeah you know, we're theater makers this is this is like our job you know, we, we recover from things going wrong all the time this is this is how we do it and so i think yeah that kind of being like yeah we'll, we'll do it and then we'll then we'll workshop it and then we'll figure it out what works what doesn't work and how we respond and i think uh yeah that that kind of really honest and um, mind courage, <laughs> courage but it's, yeah it feels like being it's like being out there and then and then do, and doing it right which is rather than perfectly making the perfect game that's absolutely balanced i mean obviously there's yeah there's, there's other kind of wider things but wider issues around that for the games industry is very different but um but yeah in my own practice that's something i'm trying to do more of i suppose yeah oh, brilliant thank you nina what impact does setting a precedent have on the audience's perception of choice a yeah, good one. Um, I think partly it depends on the precedent, but um, at the very least, what it does is it frames the choices, that, uh, how they perceive the potential outcomes for future choices. If you set a precedent that, um, you know, let's say a person will die each time you make a decision, you're going to expect that that's going to happen in the future. If you set a precedent that uh, a goal is scored every time that a, there is some voting, uh, to do with football, then that's what the audience is going to expect will happen next time that you ask them to vote. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, you know, subverting the the expectations is something that you can do the more of a precedent that you set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Robbie's on fire tonight. <laughs> Brace yourselves. <laughs> okay, Simon and Myra, what is the main challenge you have encountered when building a game world? Me? <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. Uh, okay, so um, I guess it's about meaningful choices. Mm -hmm. So to deliver like real emotional impact um thinking about the story um writing a story is already incredibly difficult um we both worked in film and tv and you know it takes years maybe decades <laughs> and adding layers of choice and complexity is um you know very difficult mm -hmm. but to make those choices meaningful so that you know your character um, would is throwing out a challenge to you that would come from that character. Already building a character is an authentic, real character is difficult. So when um, I I was the creative director of Somni, which was this large scale multi sensory experience um, that we created in London, and um, I wanted the whole thing to be very centered on story. So it could have been a very sensory um, uh, experience, but in terms of meaning, um, I wanted to ask the question at the heart of it. Um, are we so unmoored that we will default to any God? 
And the context of that is um, what if artificial intelligence were spiritual matter? And essentially you follow this AI character, but at a critical moment, they break the trust that you've built up throughout the course of the experience. Um, and you are at this point in a VR headset and the trust breaking happens outside the VR headset. Um, so playing the idea of virtual spaces. Um, but many people still followed that character and still um, into dark, um, terrifying basements um, followed them. And it, it sort of, you know, elicited this question of like, when we are detached from ourselves, that we are more likely to scoop up these narratives and these gods than the next one could be AI. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, creating meaning out of that is um, uh, creating impact, impactful choices that give you emotional, that punch you in the gut or make you feel something um, in your body. Do you think, and this is this is not a Robbie question, this is a one from me, but, you know, from having, you know, learned from you guys already this year, you know, do you think that the fact, though, that you understand all of those different elements to pre producing that world, um, you know, you're, you're doing the development yourself, you're, you're doing the VR yourself, you know, you're creating the story, you're, you're coming up with the music and the, the, you know, so you are kind of a one man, you two are a two man band for like an entire games world development sort of system. Um, does that in itself, though, you know, create something that's easier, it all fits together better and it kind of flows because everything's being produced by you guys inter in, in, internally in house? I would say it's Okay, I worked in a multidisciplinary team on Sunlight, and then Brightback is like you say, yeah, us two with uh, lots of different skill sets, and um, you know, creating a vision like a a unifying concept and a unifying vision is so is much easier, and the workflows are much more efficient, and also just in collaboration in general, like if you're on the same page as um, people, if they understand what you're trying to get to. Um, like we were working with a VR development team on Somno and it was all male and all the technical teams were male and the concept of this spiritual AI didn't translate um, really and it went really into games like traditional games worlds and some of them were from Rockstar Games so it kind of had that to it and it was just showed you how important it was that um, you know, you work in a team, you know, a diverse, interesting, creative team that can deliver this vision. So me and Simon, having come from many different backgrounds and many different uh, life experiences, find that it's much easier, even with the skill sets aside, um, to create um, things that are meaningful and have impact. It's worth keeping in mind, though, that in games world, in games companies, a lot of games companies, the right, it's not like film where the writer sits in their garret typing away on a typewriter, completes five drafts of a story and hands it over. Mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of companies, the writer is part of the team working with the games developers, with the coders. They're there in the middle of it, uh, which is out of necessity, I would say, because if you were just to step from film, and well, we saw it actually, what happened with virtual reality was that um, when 2015 came and the market for the Oculus store didn't really, it never hit the expectations, which it was never going to hit the, 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 the um, forecasts for how big the market for Oculus and VR was going to be were always ludicrous. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but they panicked a little bit. And so they started paying, uh, commissioning film, to film directors who had a name to create virtual reality experiences. And also funders, for example, in the UK, were tending to try and shift people from theater or film and various other things into the virtual reality space. And what you saw for the first time at things like Venice VR was that all the experiences were point A to point B stories where everybody had the same experience. That was never the heritage of VR. Mm -hmm. um, the heritage of VR came much more from video games, and particularly like open world games. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think the reason why what we're doing with two people is great because we can communicate um, 
there's only two of us there's there's less friction and we have all the skills and we understand what the games engine can and can't do but if you're in a big games company and you're a writer you're not writing a script anyway a lot of the time you're writing uh, a concept and you're there working as i think somebody put that up writing dialogue or you're writing and we say you know when when we moved away from film into using games engines really actually when two of us we pretty much stopped writing text down apart from things people said and things that were written down on pieces of paper that you might find in the world because why would we write it when we can just make it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what do you reckon to that nina because you're in that space aren't you with um you know you, you're a director you've written stuff you're you've created things you know do you do you agree with that yeah i mean that's exactly right i think i, I think uh very uh well said simon indeed game writing is precisely that it's writing dialogue it's writing the bits of paper that you find it's writing the books that you find it might be you know bits of menu that describe some parts of something else as well can fall into that it can be occasionally writing a document outside of the game for the team uh, but a lot of game writing becomes essentially just that that bit of content on the content side and it's not done in pre-production it's done right in the heart of making the game sometimes as an afterthought sadly sometimes as an afterthought there are many many writers that i know that are that come in you know the the project needs to be out in two months time and they're just brought into like emergency write some extra story on top just to kind of put an extra layer of of um of something to it mm -hmm. uh, at the last minute um but i think that's because games are uh, narrative is a part of games but games are not necessarily narrative if that makes sense mm -hmm. narrative games are narrative but there are many many games that mm -hmm. have narrative as one component of a bigger picture mm -hmm. um and they might you know you could argue that tetris tells a story of uh, capitalism and you know working hard and you could make those arguments but but ultimately probably there was no narrative designer that sat down and said, how can we tell a story about capitalism through game mechanics and let's make Tetris. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is, a, you know, you can, in, you can apply, you can say that there are narratives there if you look for it. Yeah. Um, but as, as people tend to make games, they don't necessarily look for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there, there is still a space though in games, particularly in narrative games for that pre-production stage of sitting down together having a writer's room, having um, maybe a writer and a narrative designer work together on like high level concepts, mm -hmm. working out who the characters are, how the story hangs together, what kind of narrative experience you want to create. Mm -hmm. I imagine, um, you know, you mentioned the Chinese room and uh, uh, Gone to the Rapture. Um, you know, I know one of the people that worked on that and all of that sort of stuff, it absolutely goes into games like that. There, there is a lot more thought done up front before the game even starts being worked on. Uh, it just depends the kind of game it is. Mm. I was going to ask you, Ben, if that was the same case with the theatre lot, but we're really running out of our over time, so um, I'm going to I'm going to part that one there. But I, you know, unless you're really really desperate to answer it, no, it was absolutely fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Apologies, Robbie. I've got six questions of yours that I haven't had a chance to answer yet. Sorry. You'll need to ask them in the next session or something similar. Um, and thank you again for all your contributions um, and for the other attendees for your questions as well. I really appreciate that. As I say, it saves these guys from the pre-programmed ones that I've sent them in advance and it gives us some spontaneity, which is always fun. Um, so um, without further ado, I can I say a massive thank you to you guys um, for taking part tonight. Um, really amazingly interesting talks again. I just I'm just really excited about how diverse and fascinating these insights have been over the week. I'm actually like le genuinely looking at all of this material and thinking, God, you could write an entire module on this. You know, it's amazing. Um, so I might be back in touch with you at some point in the future. <laughs> but um, you know, just really amazing uh, conversation as well at the end, and and it weaved together really beautifully. So big thank you to you guys. Um, just finally, a big thanks to Sign again for sponsoring the event because I need to say that or we'll never sponsor us ever again um so thank you very much <laughs> for, for the funding to run the festival um and thanks yeah thanks to you guys and we'll see you it's now the weekend officially hurrah um and we'll see you next monday for a more fun and excitement and next monday we are looking at what tools 
you can use for digital storytelling and why. Um, so we've got some interesting talks on uh, Monday to look forward to as well. So without further ado, I'll say cheerio um, and we'll see you guys next week, hopefully. And thanks again. Bye.